Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for all coming at this uh, non-standard time. It's uh, my pleasure to have Steve Cranmer here to give our seminar on uh, the solar wind and, uh, and in general stellar winds from various stars other than the sun. Uh, although we know a lot more about the one that's closest to us. Uh, Steve did his PhD at Delaware with Stan Awaki and he was a staff member at the CFA for many years. Uh, He's an excellent reviewer, if you ever get him to referee your papers. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and he's recently moved to a faculty position at uh, Colorado Boulder. So. Okay, thanks Ian. So yeah, so I'd like to talk about um, solar and stellar winds. Uh, oftentimes you don't hear about both of them sort of together. The solar wind is an example of a, of a, of a stellar wind, uh, of course. Uh, the, uh, the image I have here is, I think, one of the best uh, sort of single picture examples of actually illustrating a, a stellar wind. This is a, an eclipse image from 2008 from, from North Africa. The, uh, the, the image has been processed a bit to bring out some of the fine details. Basically, bright stuff is higher density material. You know, darker stuff is lower density. Uh, what we're, and, and what we see is that a lot of the material traces along the magnetic field lines. You know, so near the sun, we can see these you know, multipolar loops in the solar corona. You know, the sun has positive and negative magnetic polarities distributed all over its surface. So when they're near one another, the, the magnetic fields close back down. Larger scale fields uh, expand out to, to larger distances. And once you go further out from the sun, again, apologies for the, the squished image, when you go further out, the magnetic field lines appear to be stretched out into a radial direction. It's the outflow of particles that's dragging the magnetic field along with it. So this is essentially an illustration of a, uh, of a stellar wind. And I'll be talking a bit more about this later. Uh, I've got some collaborators listed down here. Again, since I just moved institutions, these are mostly people back at uh, Harvard Smithsonian and a few others. And uh, so I would like to talk about a few things. So I'll just give a brief introduction to some of the basic physics of stellar winds. You know, why do stars evaporate their, their outer envelopes into, uh, into the interstellar medium? Uh, give a quick uh, in, uh, summary of the sun and other solar type stars. What we think is happening there is that the, the strong subsurface convection zones are churning up the, uh, the plasma in the upper layers and uh, leading to uh, hot million degree outer atmospheres, stellar coronas. I'll also talk about some work I've done on massive stars where uh, instead of convection driving uh, million degree plasmas, it's the radiation pressure from the high luminosities that drives, uh, drives particles away. It's a coupling between the photons and the, uh, and the particles that drives away the particles. Uh, but some interesting physics uh, applies to, to all these different situations too. So just a quick sort of motivational slide here. What is a stellar wind? Right? It's a, I'm usually using that phrase to mean a continuous outflow of, of particles, of, of plasma, from the surface layers of a star. So by saying continuous, I'm ruling out things, bursty things like supernova explosions and flares and other kinds of uh, mass ejections that we often see in the solar wind. I'll talk a tiny bit about them later. Um, from what we can tell, pretty much all stars uh, lose mass at some level. Probably, in, in many cases, it's too low a level for us to measure, but it still seems to be happening. The, uh, the big question, why do we care? Why are you here listening to this, right? Stellar winds are, are, have an impact on a lot of different areas. The, uh, the stellar winds affect how the stars evolve. Um, not, in the earliest stages, when the stars are still accreting, a good fraction of that material is sort of redirected into an outflow. You know, Titari stars have polar outflows that might be coming in part from, from the stars themselves. So the loss of mass and angular momentum at those uh, phases affects how the uh, initial star is formed. And then the stellar wind keeps on going through the main sequence into the post-main sequence phases. And over such long time scales, the uh, mass lost from a star can end up being a significant fraction of its total mass. So it really affects sort of where it goes in the HR diagram. Uh, a lot of talk recently about planets, right? Do stellar winds affect the, either the formation or the migration or the evolution and also habitability of planets? I've got this little picture of Mars here to remind me uh, to mention that Mars was initially thought to have a much denser atmosphere than it does now. 
And because of its weak magnetic field, the solar wind pretty much ablated most of that uh, atmosphere away and led it to its current sort of arid state. So it can certainly affect whether planets are habitable or not. The, uh, going to the opposite end of you know, even larger scales, the scale of the whole galaxy, the, uh, the, uh, the composition of the gas that gets ejected by stars can, can enrich the, 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 uh, the, the metallicity of the galaxy. You know, as we go from population two to population one stars where the metallicity is enriched uh, throughout new generations of star formation, a lot of that is thought to be given back to the interstellar medium by stellar winds. And of course, there's also the, the, the practical reasons for studying our own star's wind. It interacts with the uh, magnetosphere of the Earth and can inter interject uh, uh, you know, uh, radiation and energetic particles that can have all these sort of deleterious effects on humans and their technology. So this is the proposal level, uh, proposal motivation slide here of why we are interested in this topic. Right? Uh, but to get into the physics, we'd really like to understand how stars actually drive these things. You know, there's got to be some sort of force pointing away from the star that ejects material away from the star. It's got to counteract gravity at some level. But if it was always counteracting gravity, and if it was always exceeding gravity at all levels, you know, into the stellar interior, uh, the star would, would, would sort of blow itself apart. So in order to drive a continuous stellar wind, this outward force has to sort of gradually turn itself on as you go up from the surface so that the photosphere holds itself together, but these outer layers can become peeled away. And it's really just a question of momentum balance here and uh, uh, you know, Newton's laws. But there's been a whole bunch of processes that have been suggested to be this sort of continuously rising outward force. Right? Parker suggested the gas pressure gradient for a hot million degree atmosphere. You know, if the temperature goes up rapidly as you go up from the surface, the gas pressure will go up also. And the gradient of the gas pressure, which is dropping as a function of height, um, can give you this outward force. So in order for this to work, you need to understand why the corona is a million degrees. I'll be talking about that. Stars with luminosities greater than about 100 solar luminosities can have this radiation, radiation force, radiative pressure gradient associated with it. You know, photons carry momentum, and if there's an appreciable opacity where the photons interact with uh, matter in the atmosphere, they can transfer some of that momentum to the gas and, and accelerate the material. Of course, then you have to start thinking about radiative transfer and what are the different sources of opacity. A lot of stars have sort of an underlying component of free electron Thomson scattered opacity. The problem with just relying on that is that if once you work it out, it goes as 1 over r squared, just like gravity does. So if, if gravity is winning in the photosphere, it's going to be winning everywhere else as you go up from the photosphere too. So that needs to be supplemented with something else, again, something that turns on gradually. And in different stars, essentially hot stars and cool stars, People have relied on uh, opacity having to do with ions, you know, line opacity, or opacity from dust. And again, it depends on the temperatures, whether those two different types of species are, are forming in, 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 you know, abundant enough to, uh, to, to account for intercepting enough photons to drive a wind. Uh, stars are also variable, right? Stars pulsate. They have uh, all sorts of oscillations. Some of those oscillations can leak above the surface. You know, typical textbook uh, explanations of stellar pulsations usually have them being sort of trapped at the, uh, at the outer surface, you know, bouncing around inside the resonant cavity of the star. But it's not precisely true. Some of, these wa some of this wave energy can leak out. It can accelerate. It can form shocks that can transport uh, momentum. And there can be a time average net acceleration of particles away from stars that way, too. There's also magnetic effects. A lot of that stuff might go into coronal heating as well. But also, if you have sort of closed loops of plasma, plasmoids sitting in a, in a stellar atmosphere, they can be uh, accelerated away from the sun. Essentially, they're, if they have a higher magnetic pressure, they'd have a lower gas pressure, possibly a lower density. So they might be buoyant and float away, or be possibly even pinched off like melon seeds by magnetic reconnection and carry along some of the gas. So again, a sort of smorgasbord of all the different types of uh, physical processes that can accelerate a wind. Uh, going from theory to observations, right? We, we'd like to know how we can measure these things in other stars. 
I'm just showing this little, again, another little textbook uh, illustration of spectral line formation just to uh, 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 highlight the fact that, you know, when, when people started to actually do quantitative analysis of spectral lines in stellar spectra, uh, it required an understanding of the Doppler effect, red shifts and blue shifts for individual spectral lines, of course. Um, and f to detect a stellar wind, it's interesting that w what you often have, to, often have to analyze is a combination of an absorption spectrum and an emission spectrum. Because if you've got all this gas sort of flying away from a star in all different directions, and we're looking at it from the, from the left here, uh, there's different parts of the geometry of the stellar wind that contribute different parts of a, of a spectral line. Right? The, the material that's coming straight at the observer is projected uh, against the bright disk of the star. So that typically forms an, uh, an absorption line because it's coming at us. That absorption line is blue shifted by a velocity that typically tells us about the, the velocity of the wind. But you have all this other material flying off the star in different directions. And if this is a scattering spectral line, some of these photons are going to be scattered into our line of sight. But because they're not projected against the, the, the star, projected against sort of the, the blackness of space, they form an emission uh, line, pretty much symmetric around red shifts and blue shifts. And the convolution of the two gives us this unique um, asymmetric uh, line with blue shifted absorption and red shifted emission that has been used for, for many decades to diagnose the properties of stellar winds and other stars. And throughout the 20th century, there's been a lot of other diagnostic techniques from the ultraviolet to the, the, the radio to try to understand these, these outflows as well. Our own solar wind is kind of a special case. It would be very difficult to detect from, a, uh, from, a, from another solar system, from you know, a parsecs away. But of course, we're, we're, our, our planetary environment is sort of bathed in the stellar wind, so we can detect it much more, uh, much more easily. OK, uh, I wanted to just give sort of another big picture view of stellar winds on the HR diagram. You know, this is the theorist's HR diagram with luminosity and effective temperature, the main sequence, some evolutionary tracks for brown dwarfs up to some of the most massive stars. And the individual points are observations of stellar mass loss rates. It's not a hugely populated diagram like you might see for other HR diagrams because the mass loss rate is a relatively difficult quantity to measure. But we do have it for several hundred stars in our nearby region of the galaxy. The color relates to mass loss rate. You know, red is the highest rates, 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year so that only in about 10,000 years, the star will lose about one solar mass's worth of material. So very evolutionary important, evolutionarily important there. All the way down to the solar mass loss rate of a few times 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year, which is relatively puny compared to some of these other ones. Um, the, uh, the observational error bars, which aren't plotted in color here, of course, uh, go up as you go down to lower mass loss rates. So there is some controversy about measuring the mass loss rates this low for other stars. So they might be off by, again, you know, plus or minus one in this logarithmic scale. But again, you see sort of a, uh, an overall correlation with luminosity. Brighter stars are emitting more energy from their interiors and their exteriors. So they might have more energy to transfer to a, uh, to a, to, to a wind of, of particles, which makes sense. Different, uh, different types of stars have different different characteristics, right? On the upper main sequence, we've got the massive stars. These are the ones with the uh, line-driven, you know, ion, ion uh, spectral line-driven radiation winds. I'll talk about them a bit. On the cool side, we've got the cool luminous stars. They have strong pulsations, you know, Myra-type pulsations, AGB stars. They're also cool enough to form dust in their outer layers, so they might have dust-driven winds as well. And then in the middle, stuck in the middle, are the, the solar-type stars and the ascending red giants that we believe have coro hot coronas, you know, x-rays and uh, million degree gas. And a lot of what I've been working on is to try to extend what we've learned from the sun to these other types of stars and possibly understand the winds as a byproduct of magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. So this brings us back to the sun as our sort of canonical example. This is the solar corona as observed by the uh, by the uh, SDO spacecraft that was launched a couple years ago. 
Uh, we, we see it these days primarily in the UV and the X-ray because those are the wavelengths where uh, a million degree gas emits most of its energy. It took a while to learn for us to learn that the outer atmosphere is, is a million degrees. In the, uh, in the 1870s, uh, people started to point solar point spectrometers out at these outer regions during uh, total solar eclipses. And they saw some unknown emission lines that were never uh, seen before in Earth-based uh, spectroscopy. And following on from the discovery of helium, they thought, well, OK, maybe we've discovered a new element. They called it coronium for the corona. And it was a full, uh, about almost a half a century uh, before the uh, atomic physics, you know, quantum mechanics essentially, caught up to the observations and conclusively identified those lines as being due to very highly ionized species of iron. And in order to produce such high degrees of ionization, you need a high temperature of a million degrees or so. And of course, since we've been able to launch uh, uh, telescopes, UV and X-ray telescopes, we've been able to get a much better uh, picture of the temperature and density structure of this very tenuous gas that's sitting above the solar photosphere. The, uh, the solar wind was also sort of pieced together over, over a long amount of time. I don't have it here, but in the latter part of the, the 1800s, you know, people were starting to see some cause and effect relationships between things happening on the sun and then things happening on the earth. You know, solar flare followed by periods of strong aurora borealis or something. And so that seems to indicate a causal connection, you know, something outflowing from the sun to the earth over several days. Um, a lot of this information was sort of compiled by Bierman in the early 1950s. In 1958, Parker sort of brought that all together and proposed a theoretical explanation. He said, well, if the sun really does have a million degree outer corona, that will provide enough of a gas pressure gradient to counteract gravity and do a lot of the things I mentioned early on that should be done as far as an accelerating flow that, with an outward force that turns on gradually. Um, it was kind of controversial at the time, but it was lucky that he was doing this at the dawn of the space age because he only had to wait a few years for Mariner 2 to uh, get out of the Earth's magnetosphere and provide direct you know, uh, measurements of a, of, a, of a continuous and supersonic uh, uh, stellar uh, solar wind, uh, pretty much just like he predicted. And since then, there's been a whole fleet of spacecraft and this, this is actually probably at least a decade old picture here. There's you know, do, uh, at least a dozen more spacecraft now outside the Earth's magnetosphere measuring the, uh, the properties of the, of the solar wind. And I hope my movie works, yes, because I wanted to illustrate, here's another sort of illustration of the solar wind. That initial picture was of a total solar eclipse. This is an artificial solar eclipse. Uh, uh, in, in a coronagraph instrument that's uh, on the SOHO spacecraft. Essentially, the, the disk of the sun is here. There's a, a, culting, a culting disk inside the telescope that blocks out a slightly larger region, so you can see the much fainter emission that's scattered into our line of sight from other regions. Um, this is pretty much a day's worth of observations, I think, taken at 20-minute intervals and processed with wavelets in order to, for us to better see small, uh, uh, small variations. And if you sit back and see, and if you ignore the coronal mass ejections, you know, these twisted magnetic strands that get er erupted from the surface of the sun, but if you look everywhere else, you can pretty much see with, with your eyes. Uh, your persistence of vision sort of shows you the, uh, the uh, outflowing solar wind pretty much everywhere else. Uh, there are a few places with inflowing regions you can see in the north there. But overall, you can really see the solar wind in something like this. And I'm also showing this little cartoon of the solar magnetic field where a dipole field gets stretched out uh, within only about two or three solar radii away from the surface into this more or less radial field that we can see out here. Uh, when is the When? No, what? 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 This is broadband uh, white light, broadband visible light. Um, Thompson, essentially, the Thompson's, this, it's the Thompson scattered, you know, you know, Fraunhofer spectrum of the sun scattered into our line of sight uh, by, by Thompson scattering. So if you were to take a spectrum of this, it would be basically the solar spectrum with a, with a 50 angstrom uh, uh, filter, you know, to, to, to basically filter out all the narrow spectral lines. Um, so people have done that and, and, and been able to measure the temperature of the electrons that are doing the scattering by basically how much it's 
and smeared. Yeah? So the underlying uh, wind does seem to be isotropic, but it seems to be also concentrated in sort of radio lines. Is that a physical phenomenon or just another? Yeah, uh, we're starting to get into a low density plasma environment here. Uh, low beta plasma, so the plasma sort of follows magnetic field lines. So if there's a region on the surface of the sun that's connected to the solar wind that emits a slightly higher density, higher mass flux than its neighbors, then that one magnetic field line is going to be have a, have a slightly higher density than its neighbors. And once it's processed with something like this, you can really see it sort of light up as its own thing. Now, not every radial strand here might be its own magnetic field. This wavelet thing might be producing, you know, we, you see sort of a most of these things have a, a light side and a dark side. That might be this sort of wavelet difference imaging processing type of thing going on. Um, but it, like for, for, the, for the earlier image that I showed, you can really see certain magnetic field lines are lit up with higher density and some are lower. OK. Well, to, uh, to understand the solar wind, we really need to go back and understand why the corona has this million degree temperature. This is the so-called coronal heating problem that is still an unsolved problem in solar physics. Uh, it's not really an unsolved problem because of a lack of theoretical ideas. And essentially, there's a surplus of theoretical ideas, and we just don't know how to choose between them. Right? We don't have the observations to really uh, uh, exactly rule out specific ideas or to really say this one is the, is the one that works the best. We need better observations, but we also need to take all the different theoretical ideas and develop them to the point of being able to make concrete obs uh, observational predictions as well. Um, but there, is a lot of, there are a lot of things that people can agree on. Um, pretty much everybody agrees that there's more than enough energy in the kinetic energy of the convection cells below the solar surface, that if just a small fraction of that were to be transported up above the surface and transferred into heat, that would pretty much do the job completely for heating the corona. Right? The density goes down as you're going up, so the total amount of energy in joules really doesn't have to be that, uh, that high to heat the gas above the surface. Here's just an image of the, uh, of the upper convection zone, the solar granulation. This is just a small sort of 1% slice of the, uh, of the, of the solar diameter. Uh, looking at the sun, and again in white light, it's just the surface of the sun. A few other sort of cartoons here. Of course, it's not just rising and falling convection cells at the surface. There's magnetic field that threads the solar surface to you know, sort of representative cartoons to show that. And as the cells rise and fall, the magnetic field lines get sort of uh, uh, diffused and advected around, sort of in a random walk type of a motion. And the mechanical energy in the in the convection cells can get translated into magnetic energy in these strands that are poking through the surface. Sometimes the magnetic fields can sort of get twisted up and uh, magnetic energy can be stored in them. So the big question is what are the physical processes involved that take this available energy in the convection zone, transport it up, convert some of it to magnetic energy, dissipate some of it as heat, or possibly even use some of it to go back into kinetic energy to directly accelerate the wind. There's some ideas along those lines, too. So it's, I mean, like I said, there's things everybody agrees on, but the devil's in the details, of course. So one of the ideas that I've been working with a lot is magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. Um, it's, it's basically taking the idea that the sun has these magnetic fields that thread the surface, the convection sort of shakes them and braids them. This is a simulation from Ad van Balahoen that shows how this happens. This is essentially a, a single solar flux tube with uh, turbulent motions being driven from the base and watching the turbulence uh, uh, occur and decay as you go up. This is actually a very squished image. It, the, the, the real aspect ratio would be much taller and thinner. Um, but the, uh, the turbulence takes the form of alphane waves, you know, uh, magnetic tension waves that come up along these magnetic field lines. Um, and as the, as the waves are propagating up from the sun, the background properties of the, of the solar atmosphere are changing. The density is dropping. The background magnetic field strength is dropping. And as it's going through these changing conditions, some of these waves that are propagating upward get partially reflected back down. Right? Ideally, you could think of reflection as happening at a wall. Right? If you have waves coming into a, a, a barrier between two different uh, 
regions of two different density. You know, you get partial transmission, partial reflection. But if you smooth out that wall and make it a gradual change, you can also still get uh, uh, reflection, but it's just less than it would be at a, at a sharp wall. But when you have counter-propagating al alphane waves going in both directions, those wave packets can collide with one another and in the planes transverse to the magnetic field can develop into this complex MHD turbulence. I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it in a second. Um, but essentially, as the turbulence goes down to smaller and smaller scales, eventually it causes dissipation to provide heat to the plasma. Essentially, on small enough scales, the kinetic energy in those little eddies gets uh, transferred into thermal energy, you know, random, random kinetic energy, and it, and it heats up the, the, uh, the gas. Now that was, that was a lot to talk about in just one slide, so I did want to go back and just say a little bit more about what turbulence really is and what we really think we know about it. Um, so we can, we can go back and forget about the magnetic field for a second. Just think about pure hydrodynamics, right? Um, everybody probably knows about Kolmogorov's initial models of the power law distribution of, of uh, kinetic, you know, the power in kinetic energy is a function of either frequency or wave number. Interestingly, even before Kolmogorov, von Karman and Howarth worked out some basic dimensional analysis for how turbulence might work. They had the conjecture that you can think about turbulence, you know, this, this, uh, this, this decay of, of power uh, from, from a large scale as you stir a system and it naturally develops small scales. This is from uh, Marin and Goldreich. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, you can think of the transfer of energy from large scales to small scales as a constant energy flux, not in terms of space or in time, but in this abstract uh, you know, Fourier type domain from the large scales to the small scales. And if you take what, what you know about a hydrodynamic eddy, you know, its density and velocity and its size scale, and via dimensional analysis, find, you know, compute an energy flux out of those, it turns out that, that just by making that right combination of variables, you're within an order of magnitude of the actual energy flux that you get in a turbulent system that's being continuously driven, continuously stirred. And if that constant energy flux is being put into the system by, by stirring, and then it's being sort of fed down to the smaller scales, once it gets down to the smallest scales, that eventually is a heat flux that, that heats up the gas. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the ENSATS, the, 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 uh, the, the, the assumption. And this can also be expressed in this, uh, in this Fourier space. The energy is being injected in at the large scales. Then there's this natural you know, k to the minus 5 thirds inertial range, the sort of constant pipeline of constant energy flux down to the small scales. And then as the kinetic energy gets transferred to thermal energy, it steepens and, uh, and you get this so-called dissipation range. Now there's a lot of interesting physics in that dissipation range, especially in the collisionless parts of the solar wind where you don't have Coulomb collisions to support things like viscosity and thermal conductivity. Those are the things that are normally in earth-based fluids invoked to, to produce this dissipation. When you don't have those, there's some other interesting plasma physics effects, Landau damping, ion cyclotron resonance that can go on to uh, damp out the fluctuations. Now, I could give a whole other talk on those, and if anybody's curious, we can, we can talk about them. But, but for the rest of this talk anyway, I'm going to sort of take on faith that if the energy is pumped in at the large scales and we see evidence for a cascade that eventually it all has to come out as, as heat to, uh, to increase the temperature of the gas. Now this is all without a magnetic field. When you put in a magnetic field, turbulence becomes very anisotropic um, and that's due to the magnetic tension, right? You can think of magnetic field lines. Here's a snapshot of a simulation. You can almost think of the magnetic field lines as sort of a bunch of uncooked spaghetti that you're holding in your hands, right? If you want to crumple up that spaghetti and turn the large scales into small scales, it's much easier to shuffle the spaghettis, you know, uh, uh, in, a, in a transverse dimension relative to one another than it is to create bends bends along the, the, the parallel direction of the spaghetti. Silly analogy, I think, but, but it seems to hold up in terms of the high magnetic tension. You know, this is a simulation with a, with a left to right magnetic field. They drive turbulence. There's small scales being developed in the direction transverse to the field, but in the direction parallel to the field, 
it's still mostly parallel. There are some bends along the field that are being created, but much more small uh, scale uh, turbulent cascade is happening in the transverse direction. I also mentioned last time uh, in the last slide that, the, uh, that, the, that these eddies are, now ju are not just these little shear driven structures that look the same in any direction. They're, they're basically composed of counter propagating alphane wave packets that are colliding with one another as they transport along the background magnetic field. So with all that, we can go through and we can, um, well, people have done simulations and laboratory experiments to look at all these things. And they've sort of built up more sophisticated phenomenological scalings for this heating rate, essentially the, the cascade rate that we got from dimensional analysis from von Karman and Howarth have been sort of made a little bit more sophisticated by taking into account a lot of these effects. Now there's uh, some, some uh, efficiency factors that are put out front. This V cubed gets uh, split up into a symmetric term that depends on the amplitudes of the alphane waves, the velocity amplitudes of the alphane waves going in both directions, you know, V plus and V minus. If either one of those was zero, then you wouldn't have any turbulence. You know, you need a non-zero component in both of those. And this length scale turns out to have to be a perpendicular length scale because that's where the real action is in, as far as the, the turbulent cascade. And there's been decades worth of sort of calibration and, and, uh, and other theoretical work to try to back this up. So what we've done, well, specifically what we did in 2007, was to take this uh, phenomenological model and input it into a, a coronal heating solar wind acceleration model and try to see if this, this can actually produce the coronal heating and solar wind that we, uh, that we see. And it does, seem, it does seem to do it. Um, it seems to reproduce a lot of the, sol the observed properties of the coronal heating in the solar wind. This is sort of a summary slide that just shows the various magnetic flux tubes that we, we modeled. This is that sort of simple stretched out dipole configuration that you mainly see at the minimum of the sun's 11 year solar cycle. Uh, the colors sort of represent individual one dimensional models along the flux tubes. Um, we have good solar wind speed measurements that were done by the Ulysses spacecraft a few uh, decades ago when it went out of the plane of the ecliptic and flew over the poles. So it went from high northern latitudes in the, in the solar system to, hot, to southern latitudes. The, uh, the black curves here show one of these pole to pole scans in terms of latitude. The curves show the predictions of the model, which weren't, weren't tweaked in any way. We had this natural uh, transition from high speeds over the poles to low speeds over the, uh, over the equator. The, the rainbow and the brown curves show two slightly different models that, if I could just go back, they, that they have different assumptions for this efficiency factor out front, which is still a topic of current research. Um, but they, they basically do the right thing. This is the temperature as a function of height. Again, this is a very uh, sort of compressed logarithmic scale in terms of height above the solar photosphere. So we have the photosphere, the solar chromosphere, the rapid transition region to a maximum of a, a million or two million degrees or so in the lower corona, about a one solar radius up from the surface. And then temperatures of around 10 to the 5 K that are often seen by spacecraft at 1 AU, which is at the right edge of the plot here, 200 or so solar radii. And the models do seem to do a lot of the right things. Why do you get those low velocity in the equator regions? Ah, the, this rapid transition from fast to slow happens because the, the Parker critical point has a, na has, a, has, a, has a rapid break from being near the sun over the poles to being further away from the sun over the equator. It's the, well, it's, it's a modified sonic point. It's a, it's, it's, there's, um, there's wave pressure acceleration in there too, but you can, you can, you can modify what the critical point is. Yeah, no, no, no rotation in this one. So this is, we haven't yet put in the, the Weber Davis uh, uh, effects yet. Um, what about but, the, the compound is the shape of the magnetic field in the low latitudes compared to the high latitudes? Um, this, this model here is a, is a, is a sort of a semi-analytic model that Banishkevich and colleagues put together a few years ago for the solar wind. It, it has, a, it has a, a dipole, a quadrupole, and a, a split monopole term that were who, whose, whose, whose relative strengths were adjusted to match some of the uh, observations 
some of the initial SOHO observations of the, of the, of the shapes of the magnetic field, particularly in the, at the edges of these polar coronal holes. Um, Yeah, it, yeah. That that actually has to do with the fact that we have a transition from electron from classical Spitzer electron conduction near the sun to a collisionless version of that from Joe Halweg uh, from the early 70s, further from the sun. And there's a linear dependence on the wind speed in in the collisionless um, conduction. Um, so I think that's one of the things that that keeps it keeps it flatter as you go out there. Is there any data? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, no, there's a, and the next slide I'll show a little bit more of a con comparison with data because we, we have measurements of, you know, at 1AU, we have a lot of different measurements of, of a whole range of different solar wind speeds from, you know, 250 to, to, to 900 or so kilometers per second. One more thing. Oh, you oh said, sure. You said this jump in the Parker sort of critical point there, but you didn't say why. Ah, that's due to the, um, due to the, to, due to the expanding geometry. You know, in a, in, of the flux tubes, right? The, uh, in fact, there's, there, there are, at a whole range of intermediate latitudes, there's actually two possible locations that the, that the Parker critical point could be at, but there's only one solution that's globally stable from, from subsonic near the sun to supersonic away from the sun, and you have to choose the right one. So this isn't really a self-consistent model. You, you, you get the critical points because of the way the flux tubes are put in by hand from the observation. Right, it's not a self-consistent MHD. So if, if, you, if you take the magnetic field as a given, this is the self-consistent hydrodynamic flow that goes along them. Well, yes? Well, that leads to the next question. Okay, so um, I can see how it's very reasonable to take the magnetic geometry for an observation, but, but when the, the dipole, when the field lines are diverging more rapidly than dipole, you get a very strong outward Lorentz force, right? You're including a Lorentz force from the background field geometry on the floor. Yes, uh, the, the, that's in there. The, the, the other thing that, that would naturally show up in the full MHD equations would be a transverse uh, force. Uh, essentially, ma the, the magnetic pressure would want to, would, would want to change those I, shapes, I, I, I which we're not putting that, in. But that, you know, you're taking the, 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 the foidal flux distribution from observation, so you're not solving the transverse. Transverse field equation, but it's still given a, 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 a toilet flux distribution, there is an implied outward Lorentz force. Yep. Right? And so, where, uh, the thing that's puzzling me a little bit is that where the field lines are, are seem to be that diverging pretty rapidly, well, it's not a separate apex, but you know, where the field lines are flowing toward the equator, um, it looks like they're diverging very rapidly there. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to be any acceleration coordinated with that. It seems to be accelerating more slowly. Well, the, well, certainly once you get past this transition to the higher critical point, when you have a higher critical point, the, the hydrostatic part of the atmosphere is sort of puffed up. And uh, so there's, there's not as much acceleration that way because, you know, once the further out the sonic point is, the, the less acceleration after the sonic point you get to. It's, it's one of many forces that, that goes in. And of course, the, the coronal heating changes, the temperature changes in those regions too. Yeah, we can, I, could, I could go in and dig those out. OK. Yeah, I wanted to compare also with the, the, with the wind speed at various uh, locations. So these are plots. I hope you can see it all. Each, the x-axis of each of these is the wind speed um, from less than 300 to more than 800 kilometers per second. The blue regions are essentially the, 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 the range of observations from various uh, in-situ spacecraft, most of which are at 1 AU. Helios was at slightly closer to the, uh, in, in, the, in the inner heliosphere. The black curves are what, the, uh, what this 2007 model predicted. It seems to be doing pretty much a good job. There's, there's some things that could be done better. The one thing that we were not happy with in 2007 was that our, our, even though we got the trend right, the overall normalization for the frozen in heavy ion abundances, this is the abundance of oxygen 7 plus divided by oxygen 6 plus measured at 1 AU. 
seems like an sort of an esoteric thing to measure, but because the, the, the most of the solar wind is collisionless, the ionization processes that, that, that determined the ratio of those different uh, ionization states of oxygen, those were all happening much down into the, uh, closer down into the corona. So, and then they were sort of frozen into this state and then just passively flew out to 1 AU. So this uh, ratio of ionization, ionization states has often been used as a diagnostic of the coronal temperature, even though you're measuring things at 1 AU. And this trend is telling us something about how the coronal temperature varies. Um, we didn't quite get it right in just last year. Uh, we've published a new paper, a, a, a letter that, that, that did a slightly better job with that by taking into account the fact that the electrons in the solar wind form a suprathermal tail uh, pretty much self-consistently due to the fact that uh, the, uh, the electrons are transporting over relatively large distances. So you really can't think of it as, as a Maxwellian distribution at each height. You know, each one of those Maxwellian distributions is going to bleed into its surrounding uh, regions. And as the temperature changes, you can see signals of that at different, at different heights. It's the it's more it's more the halo. The uh, there's a there's a core distribution of electrons at one AU. They measure a core, a a, a a a another slightly Maxwellian component that's maybe seven times hotter. And then in the direction of just the outflowing solar wind, they see a much higher uh, uh, distribution of electrons. The the Strahl in German, stream I guess. Um, but yeah, this was this was essentially uh, Jack Scudder and uh, Stanislaw Olbert's model. Of, uh, of, 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 of partially collisional electron transport that went into to computing this. Okay, so yeah, so, so it seems to work. This is, seems to provide at least one solution to the coronal heating problem that, that, that has to be compared with all the other ones out there. And it also has to be confronted with a lot of other observational data. So for example, there's been a lot of measurements of density fluctuations in the, in the solar corona, right? These alphane waves that I've been using don't carry density fluctuations, but we observe them. Um, so time-dependent multidimensional simulations are starting to add more. Uh, the Japanese group, Matsumoto and Suzuki, have been doing some 2D simulations uh, where they, they don't treat the, MH, the, the alphanic part of the turbulence that correctly, but they, they do have full MHD, so they drive density fluctuations along with, the, uh, along with the transverse velocity fluctuations. And there seems to be some mode coupling between the alphane waves and these compressive waves, possibly forming things that look like jets that fly up that might, might match some of the uh, observations of the solar corona as well. So there's a lot of uh, current work going on to try to make these models more sophisticated. So, so we think of density fluctuations I think near the surface of the sun, I think slow mode uh, magnetosonic waves are the are the ones that drive the most. Yeah, and and indeed, they, they do seem. These are only. This is only a tiny fraction of a uh, solar radius. So I think the slow mode waves do damp out very rapidly. Even if you kept everything as a, as a classical Spitzer you know, plasma, those things would, would damp out via conduction in just maybe a tenth of a solar radius or so above the surface. So is there new evidence for compressibility? I remember a paper by Greg Hallows and Stuart Dale showing that there, there was very little compressive power in the solar wind at 1 AU. At 1 AU, yes. But so, so a lot of it is probably gone by the time. This is all very near the sun. So yeah. I think it's all. Yeah, <laughs> megameters, not, not terameters. <laughs> um, so I, I, I didn't want to leave this talk and think that, that, that everybody agrees that waves and turbulence are the, are the way to go. There's plenty of other ideas out there. Magnetic reconnection is a big one, right? If the convective motions at the surface are very slow, then the magnetic field lines that thread the solar atmosphere can get slowly moved around into a sequence of sort of quasi-static uh, states. And those quasi-static states will get more and more twisted and, 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 and full of non-potential magnetic fields. And eventually, that'll build up enough magnetic energy for it to break, essentially, where oppositely directed fields annihilate one another, form uh, 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 ejections, you know, uh, flares, 
jets, coronal mass ejections that, that, that feed material up into the corona. That's got to be some part of it. We, we see them, for example, on the, on the large scales. But the question is, how much of this, uh, uh, how much of this, how much of the background solar corona is created by these things? Again, still an open question, but it's worthwhile looking at. You know, these CMEs are these loops of non-potential twisted strands that eventually become buoyant and get lifted off in, in features like this. But I didn't want to go too far because I still think that turbulence is an important component of these things. You know, if, you, if when people measure the properties of these loops as they rise up, they see a lot more thermal energy and a lot more uh, uh, wave, evidence for waves in these plasmas than is predicted by some of the basic MHD models. So I think a lot of our insights uh, from turbulence that we got from these sort of basic models of magnetic field lines that just thread the surface can also be applied to these more uh, complicated systems too. Okay, so I think that's about all I had for the sun. We can also think about other sun-like stars. You know, if these things are happening for the sun, they have to be happening for other stars. We know that there's a whole swath of stars on the cool side of the HR diagram with convecti convective uh, layers right under their surfaces. People have gone through and computed the expected yield of alphane waves at the surface as a function of stars, you know, effective temperatures and surface gravities. Those are the colored curves here from Musilac and Olmschneider. We extended these to other, uh, other effective gravities to, uh, to try to get a better predictive tool for what the flux of alphane waves should be. And if we know that for a given star, we can, you know, we can go through and do the same thing. Now, in instead of solving this full set of mass, momentum, and energy conservation equations, what I did with Steve Saar a few years ago was just to, s to look at a simplified version of the thermal energy conservation that one gets by converting these, uh, these alphane wave, this alphane wave flux into, uh, into coronal heating and, of, and calibrating it using what we know by the sun. So since I don't have too much time, I'll sort of skip to the end and sort of show you what the end result of that was. Here's that same HR diagram again of the uh, measured mass loss rates. This box here are the, the solar type and red giant stars that we were concentrating on. And these are the observations. And the models showed a relatively good reproduction of those, uh, of those, uh, of those mass loss rates. Again, there were no sort of adjustable parameters here. There were some that we initially fixed to, uh, to make the sun work out and use a lot of the same physics from the solar models. But then we just ran it for all the other stars and we got something very similar. There are, uh, there are a bunch of uh, scaling laws in the literature for how to predict the mass loss rates of, of stars in this part of the HR diagram. Uh, Schroeder and Kuntz and Reimers and others, uh, people use them in stellar evolution, you know, population synthesis calculations. Ours actually has a better chi-squared, at least compared to these stars that we collected from the literature, than, uh, than those other ones. So I'm hoping people can start to use it. Um, okay. I think that's it for the cool stars. I wanted to say a few things about these massive stars again. Before you make that switch, oh, sure. Just kind of briefly on the issue of alternatives versus nanoplanes. I mean, making small scale strand transverse structure in the, in the magnetic field directly by you know, moving field lines around versus a cascading process. Um, you know, uh, most of the newer sort of simulations of, you know, basically sort of ground truth simulations, simulations of, you know, 3D, MHD, drive the base and see what happens. What they seem to be showing is something in between. You know, it seems to be very dynamic. There seems to be alphane waves propagating along. And a lot of the changes, there's a lot of power at short time scale changes that, uh, that, that don't evolve quasi-statically. Um, but the alphane waves are extremely sort of bursty in their, in their, in their energy loss. Now, individual alphane wave packets collide with another one and produce a burst of heating at a given place that looks very much like what Parker thought a nanoflare would look like. So in some ways, I think you can use the, the wave and turbulence language to talk about a lot of this bursty nanoflare type stuff too. Um, or or use the nanoflare language to describe what the turbulence predicts. But I think it might end up being sort of a mix of the various, uh, of, of the two extreme 
ideas. You know, the, the, another way of talking about it was AC versus DC coronal heating, right? The waves are AC because they're being driven at a high frequency and the waves propagate up before things happen. The slow churning is DC, direct current, uh, quasi-static evolution. But if you look at the time scales involved, there's really time scales that, that bridge the gap between the AC and the DC limits. Oh, to be higher for the for the red giants, um, it's uh, the the lower gravity is a big part of it, because if you have a given flux of energy at a at a lower gravity, more of that can can escape as a as a wind. Um, there's it's 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 really just. That's right. That there, some of these stars do have lower temperatures. The, the 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 mass loss model that we had here had both a coronal component and a a cold alphane driven wind component. That the sun usually never enters that regime, uh, but lower gravity stars uh, can can do that, where the alphane waves propagate up, don't dissipate, and uh, and carry momentum that can that can drive the wind also. The the, uh, the flux. Well, that's, the, that, that's what we essentially extracted from these models by, by Musilak and Umschneider. They had a convection model for, 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 for each of the points along these curves. They had, a, they had a full interior model with convection, maybe just mixing length model, but, but still a full model. And, and then they, they worked out how much of that energy was converted into, uh, into uh, transverse magnetic you know, MHD waves at the surface. So, uh, we assume that. Well, yes, in, in our model, we assume that there's, there's a certain fraction of the stellar surface that's covered by open magnetic flux tubes. Um, and that scales with stellar activity, which, which we use the, the well-known sort of age activity rotation uh, correlations for these other stars with measured rotation rates. All these stars have measured rotation rates. So we use the known correlations between age and activity and rotation to get the total magnetic flux, uh, total open magnetic flux that covers the surface. So the um, the yes. The, probably let him wrap up so that the other, the other copy two theory. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, could, I could just talk quickly about the, uh, the, uh, the massive stars. I mean, they're, they're interesting because they, uh, it, it turns out that for these hot stars, spectral lines due to ions are the key to accelerating winds. Again, sir, apologies for switching topics here. But the, the, the opacity goes up very strongly in these spectral lines. And high opacity means you're capturing more of the photons, right? The, the acceleration due to radiation is an integral over the spectrum of the product of the flux times the, uh, uh, times the uh, absorption coefficient. So you can get some interesting effects, especially when there's Doppler shifts going on. You know, these, these thin little pieces of, uh, of opacity get Doppler shifted relative, if you're out in the wind and it's flowing out relative to the stellar surface, you're seeing a net Doppler shift between the source of photons and the source of opacity. So essentially these things can sort of sweep their way through the spectrum and, and, and uh, encounter a lot more uh, uh, of the photons than it normally would if it was just all undoppler shifted. It's some neat feedback effects in the, uh, in the acceleration. Uh, in, the, in the equation of motion that Castor, Abbott, and Klein worked out. Uh, essentially, the acceleration depends on the acceleration. So there's sort of a positive feedback between those things. Um, but this is all sort of a solved problem, right? Uh, uh, for, for spherical stars, it's relatively well understood 
A lot of what I've been thinking about is non-spherical stars. Hot stars are very rapidly rotating. They can become oblate. You can sort of see the oblateness there where the equatorial regions have their gravity canceled out partially by uh, centrifugal forces. So you might expect more mass loss over the equator. But these stars also have brighter poles than their equator. This is the so-called gravity darkening effect. So because they're radiation driven winds, they might have more mass loss over the poles. The question, which one of those winds, is still an open question that people are thinking about. These stars are also pulsators. This is not a movie of a pulsation. This is just a movie that loops through all the different pulsational modes. Um, but again, just like the sun, even though most of the energy is trapped below the surface, some fraction of it can leak out into the stellar winds and cause uh, variability in the stellar winds. Uh, the, there's some very interesting stars out there that seem to have this. BW Vulpecula is a, is a beta Cepheid pulsator that has strong shocks in its atmosphere. But when you look at its P Cygni profiles, not quite visible here, you see absorption that propagates out from the center of the line over time going up from the center of the line out to high blue shifted velocities. These are dense shells that are being propagated out every rotation, every pulsation period of this uh, star. So I, I've, I've worked a little bit on this. This slide actually was an advertisement to students saying how, how this work is unfinished and how we need students to, to come in and, uh, and uh, do some more work on it. So if anybody's curious, please, we can follow up. Uh, there's also other pulsating stars, such as the classical BE stars. They have dense disks around them that are ejected from the surfaces. These aren't accretion disks. They're decretion disks. Um, but how the disks are formed are still, uh, are still unknown. Pulsations are thought to be a part of it. And I've worked a little bit on that. But uh, we still need to, to do some real simulations to, uh, to prove that these things are working. Um, we still, of course, want better observations to put better constraints on all these things, right? From the sun, we still really haven't seen down to the tiny little magnetic flux tubes that are being uh, uh, jostled by convection. DKIST, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, is being built on Hawaii. Four meter uh, diameter mirror that's going to do a much better job. There's also better observations of the acceleration region of the wind. Solar Probe Plus is going to start to go into there in a few years. And of course, for other stars, we really want to do better with spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is great. Spectral polarimetry is the, is the sort of the future. And also interferometry would be nice. And that's it, really. We're, I don't think the theories are doing too badly. We've still got a lot to do, especially as far as folding in observations. And uh, personally, I found uh, this to be a great field for sort of interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, solar, stellar, other fields of astrophysics even laboratory plasma physics. There's been a lot to learn from, from everybody. So thank you very much. Any additional questions for Stephen? Covered a pretty hard grand job. <laughs> if there's none right now, I'll allow people to depart to head to the other seminar, and uh, we can uh, continue the conversation over cookies and tea upstairs. And uh, let's thank Stephen. Thanks.